Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. It's like you made it through opposition one, you made it through opposition two. God, I don't understand. I'm trying to do the right thing and it just keeps us. I'm just having one problem after another problem after another problem. Well, God, maybe this is not you. I guess I'll just give up. I mean, God, I really thought this was you, but I wasn't expecting it to be this hard. Hang on, you can defeat those giants. You can defeat the giants. Today I want to talk to you about defeating giants. Because any time that you decide that you're going to go forward in anything, if you're here in this conference and you something grasps your heart and you think, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to just keep putting up with this. I'm going to start really working with God to, to see that thing changed in my life. Or, you know, I, I don't want to just have an okay marriage, I want to have a great marriage. You know, I, I don't want to just be an, an okay parent just waiting for my kids to grow up and get out of the house. I want to really have influence with my children during these years that I have left. Or maybe you say, you know, I, I have a dream to minister the Word of God, and I've kind of I've let go of that. I've let go of my dream to be used by God and just gotten sucked up in all my problems again, and I'm going to start pressing forward again. Or I want to get out of debt. I'm tired of being in debt. I'm going to get out of debt. No matter, now listen, no matter what you decide, When you start trying to go forward, and I, I hope this doesn't sound negative to you, but it's just truthful, you are going to get opposition from the devil. And if you don't plan for that, if you don't have a mindset for that, then you're going to just probably get knocked out of the box before you ever get to first base. We think that just because God promised something that it should be an automatic. But that's not true. All things with God are possible, But not all things with God are positively going to happen while we just sit back and do nothing. The Apostle Paul, great apostle, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, he said, A wide door of opportunity has opened unto me, and with it many adversaries. Now, you know, there are little giants and there are big giants. And I had about four little giants yesterday before the conference started last night. First of all, I'm preaching to you this weekend with two fractured toes. So you see there, got them all taped up and don't know exactly what's going on, but I've fractured three toes in the last year. And so anyway, we're, we're working on that. But I just fractured another one. Well, I'm not going to just stay home because I've got a fractured toe. I'm going to tape them up. And I, I mean, somebody said to me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do if they put a boot shoe on you? I said, well, I guess I'll go out and preach at a boot shoe, you know? <laughs> I mean, my gift is not in my foot, it's in my mouth. <laughs> you know, too many people just give up too easy. Well, then, you know, we got here last night and, and I'm, you know, Dave's taping my feet and I'm getting ready for the meeting. and and. I, I got my boots on, I was going to hide my tape and everything's going to be good and got my pants on and something was wrong. I just, I'm like, what's wrong with this? I look ridiculous. I could, well, it took me a while to figure it out, but it was a new pair of pants and the lady that was supposed to alter them forgot to hem them. So I got the boots on and I'm dressed, and, but I got all these wrinkles in my pants because they're way too long. Okay, so we got to change that whole outfit. We changed that whole outfit and that's good, but it's a little bit frantic because it's right at the last minute. Got over here last night and I had forgotten my message. Left it at the hotel room. Well, you know, I don't use the thing half the time, but I want it. I want it just in case I need it. So I am like, you got to go back and get the message. Then last night before I came up to preach, I went back to the bathroom and I wear this silly microphone, you know, and all these cords and stuff where you got to pull a wire out and push wires together. And I pulled one of the main wires out and dropped the silly thing in the toilet. <laughs> Little giants. And see, in the midst of all this, here's the thing. I don't know if you realize how important it is for me to be peaceful and calm. 
Honestly and truly, the devil sets you up to get you upset. And the truth is, now listen, the truth is, as soon as we get upset and we get emotional, we stop hearing from God. <laughs> now all we're hearing from is our own frustration and our own mind, and now we're aggravated at everybody because, you know, they shut on you, shut on you, shut on you. <laughs> and I know the sound guys are going, well, why didn't you tell us you dropped the microphone? Because I just blew it off and dried it. And, you know. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back. I just thought I'd throw that out just in case you think that this is all a cakewalk for me. Well, those things are minor. Those are, those are what you would call little daily aggravations. I mean, really, they're just life. But honestly and truly, and I really don't want you to be frightened by this. There are some things in life that just go real smooth, but they don't all. And we need to be ready to stand our ground and to refuse to give up. It's never too late for you to begin again, but don't think for one minute that when you step out to try that the enemy won't take a step against you to try to drive you back. It might be a mental attack. It might be an attack even through people that you love who will tell you that you can't do it. I mean, have you ever noticed that even people that should be for you don't always believe that you can do what God has told you that you can do? Amen? And um, so I want us to learn a lesson this morning from a couple of men in the Bible, one of them, Nehemiah. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in the book of Nehemiah and jump around and look at quite a few scriptures, but there's a real story here that I think will help you. So we're going to go first of all to Nehemiah chapter 1. Okay, in Nehemiah chapter 1, we see that Verse 2, Hananiah, one of my kinsmen, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them about their surviving Jews who had escaped exile and about Jerusalem. So Nehemiah wanted to know about how his brothers, his kinsmen were doing. And they said the remnant there, verse 3, the remnant there in the province who escaped exile are in great trouble and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its fortified gates are destroyed by fire. So he heard they were in trouble. So I just want you to think for a minute, what is your response when you hear that other people are in trouble? You know, I think that we need to have a little more of an attitude of, let's see if maybe God wants me to help. I think very often it's just like, well, that's too bad, I'll pray for them. And prayer is, of course, good. But I think one of the things we need to pray is, God, if there's something you want me to do, show me. Come on, now listen to me. God, if there's something you want me to do, show me. Instead of just having this attitude, well, you know, somebody needs to do something. or, Well, yeah, I'll pray and God will do something. I think a lot of times it doesn't even occur to us that we need to do something. And, you know, part of our life and vibrancy, part of our joy and our passion is not in sitting by passively doing nothing, waiting for somebody to do something for us, but it's in actively doing things for other people. Part of your healing is being active and helping and being a blessing to other people. Come on, give God praise. And I want you to look at Nehemiah's response. This tells us why Nehemiah was a man that God could use. Verse four, and when I heard this, <clears throat> I sat down and I wept. And I mourned for days, and I fasted, and I prayed constantly before the God of heaven. I think that that's just worth looking at his character. Sometimes we wonder why God uses certain people and not others. Well, you know, God wanted somebody that would be bold enough to stand up and say, we need to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We need to take back what the devil has stolen. It's not too late. It looks like a total defeat, but we can rebuild. And I want to tell you that you can rebuild your life. No matter what kind of a disappointing or even a tragic thing has happened to you, you can rebuild your life. Whether it's the loss of a job or the loss of a fortune or the loss of a spouse, maybe you've lost a loved one to death, maybe there's been a divorce or an abandonment or rejection, 
I mean, a lot of things happen to people. Even your health. Maybe you feel like you've lost your health because you haven't taken care of yourself. Well, it's not too late to begin again. It's not too late to get healthy. I don't care how bad a shape you're in, it's not too late to start exercising and taking care of yourself. It's never too late. But one of the lies that the devil tells us was well, just too late. You're in too bad a shape now. It's too late. And then you spend the rest of your life regretting that you didn't do the right thing back over there somewhere instead of taking that same energy to start a new beginning right now. We're not supposed to live in regrets. We're supposed to see what we didn't do right, learn from that history, and then go forward and do the right thing. You don't have to say, well, I'm so deep in debt, debt it's never too late. I'll never get out of debt, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I just might as well file bankruptcy or something. No, what you should do is say, God can give me a plan to overcome this. It's not too late. It's not too late to be financially stable. It's not too late to go back to school. It's not too late to start a new career. It's not too late to be loved again. It's not too late for me to get healthy. It's not too late to get in shape. Everybody shout out very loud, it's not too late. It's not too late. So Nehemiah went on to pray prayer, prayers of repentance for not only him but all of Israel. And then as it turns out, God was calling him. Part of this passion that he felt was God calling him to do something to rebuild these walls. So let me just encourage you by saying that when you feel a passion to do something in a certain area, more than likely that passion is God speaking to you. Now, I'm not just talking about a fleshly thing. I'm talking, see, I am passionate about what I'm doing. I am so passionate about teaching people the Word of God that it is my life. That is what I have given my life to for the last 38 years and will continue to do that until the day that Jesus brings me home because He spoke to me and put something in my heart. When you're passionate about something, if you don't fulfill that desire, you are going to be frustrated the rest of your life. Amen? Amen? Nehemiah was passionate. So he went to the king and he asked permission to go to this place where the wall was broken down. He asked if the king would give him letters to present to the local authorities there. And he even asked for letters to give to the local timber guys so he could get timber. And he got a plan and he went. He talked to a lot of other people. He stirred some other people up. He said, this is the condition of Jerusalem. Come on, we need to go rebuild the walls. Now listen, sometimes when there's a problem that's too big for you to handle, why don't you get passionate enough to go get a few other kind of dead, passive, lazy believers <laughs> that aren't doing anything except crabbing about what everybody else is not doing? And why don't you say, look, there's a need over here and it's more than I can handle by myself. How about if we all get involved? You know, it only takes one person to get a whole bunch of people stirred up to do something. Can you hear me? It only takes one person to get a whole bunch of people are waiting. They're waiting for somebody to show them what to do. They're waiting for somebody to organize a group and say, let's go help these people. And boy, when you get involved in helping somebody else, the excitement begins to flow. The creative, God's not going to give you power for nothing. He only gives us power to do something. And so, okay, they got passion. They've got dream. They've got a plan. They've got permission. Now they go, and they're ready to get started. So let's look now at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard this, it distressed them exceedingly that a man had come to inquire for and require the good and the prosperity of the Israelites. Now, we can replace Sanballat the Horonite with the devil, and we can replace Tobiah the Ammonite with all the devil's little demons. So we're going to see that when people try to stop us from doing what God has called us to do, or when we go to build something and the enemy tries to stop us, or we go to start something and people, it's always the devil working through people. In this case, it was Sanballat and Tobiah, but they were distressed. The enemy is always distressed when he feels that you've made a decision to go forward. Do you understand that? How many of you have made some decisions in your life to go forward? 
Okay, keep that hand up. How many of you are getting some opposition on the other side? Let's see that other hand go up. All right, see that? It, it may be big giants, maybe little giants, but they're going to try to stop you. So, then in um, chapter 2, <laughs> chapter 2, verse 17, I've got a lot of scripture here, and I can't stand here and read to you forever because I'll lose you, but I want to just read you the important parts here. Then I said to them, you see the bad situation that we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates are burned with fire. Come on now, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a disgrace. You see, I think when our lives are in a mess, we owe it to God to try to rebuild them. Because I think it's a disgrace to him after what he did for us and the price that he paid for us, for us to sit passively by and agree to just stay in bondage and stay in the pits the devil digs for us. If you don't want to get out for yourself, at least do it for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Then I told them how the hand of God was upon me for good and also, also how the words of the king had spoken to me. Verse 19, but now here's going to come the devil and the demons again. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Gershom the Arab heard of it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Do you really think that you can rebel against the king? So now they've made a decision to go forward and somebody's laughing at them and making fun of them and telling them that it's just not going to work. <laughs> Have you ever decided that you're going to get something fixed in your life and maybe a good friend, even somebody that you love that you really wanted to be for you, just kind of silently gave you a message that they really didn't think that... Come on, come on. You know, I actually had people laugh at me when I told them what I felt the call of God was on my life. I mean, I still remember sitting around a campfire at a church hayride thing, and they were roasting hot dogs and marshmallows, and there were four or five of us sitting there, and man, I was just full of this vision, and oh, I'm going to teach the Word, and God's going to use me, and my life is going to be restored, and I was just so excited. And one of the girls said, did you actually say, somebody told me you said that you thought you were going to head up this large ministry. Did you really say that? I said, yeah, I'm just so excited. I really believe God's going to use me. And this woman looked at me and she said, well, to tell you the truth, we have been talking. <laughs> now, you know, that's trouble right there. We have, we have been talking. And, and this is what they said. And to be honest, we don't think you've got the right personality for it. Well, you know what? I'm still here. Yeah. All right, now, we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 4. But when Sanballat, I don't even know who Sanballat is. He's representing the devil. When Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, doesn't matter what you're building, if you're going to build anything. He was angry and in a great rage, and he ridiculed the Jews. Now he's ramping it up to another level. First, he just got aggravated because they were trying to build. Then he laughed at them because they were trying to build. Now he's just flat out mad. And you know, sometimes if the devil don't stop us with a few little things, then he just gets downright angry and he pulls out some of the bigger guns. And he said before his brethren, the army of Samaria, Samaria what are these feeble Jews doing? See, now here comes the belittling and the diminishing. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things at will and by themselves? Will they try to bribe God with sacrifices? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, seeing that they are burned up? And then they just went on and on and on and on. But that didn't stop Nehemiah, verse 6, so we built the wall, <laughs> and all of it was joined together to half of its height, for the people had a heart and a mind to work. And when Sanballat, the devil, Tobiah, the Arabians, the Ammonites, and the Ashtorites heard that the wall of Jerusalem were going up and that the brethren were being closed, then they got very angry 
and they all plotted together come and fight against Jerusalem to injure and cause confusion and failure. Do you, does anybody see what's happening here? He just keeps, this should resonate with some of you in your life. It's like you made it through opposition one, you made it through opposition two. God, I don't understand. I'm trying to do the right thing and it just keeps us, I'm just having one problem after another problem after another problem. Well, God, maybe this is not you. I guess I'll just give up. I mean, God, I really thought this was you, but I wasn't expecting it to be this hard. Hang on, you can defeat those giants. You can defeat the giants. But you can't be wimpy. I mean, do you honestly think that me and Dave or anybody else who's got a vital ministry that's really helping a lot of people, do you think that when we said we wanted to start this 38 years ago and I started in the basement of my home, do you honestly think that we got from there to here without a lot of opposition and a lot of sand ballots and a lot of Tobias and a lot of all the different people who came against us. I think that we just need to get a little bit tougher than what we are sometimes, folks. I think we need to realize who our God is and that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. There is probably not one day of my life when I don't confess out loud, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I am more than a conqueror through Christ and no weapon formed against me shall prosper, but every tongue that comes against me in judgment, I will show to be in the wrong. I will finish what I have started. And I'm just gonna say this, I'm just gonna be bold about it. If you don't intend to finish, then don't start. Because <laughs> I'm tired of false starts. Well, I think I'll do this. Well, it's too hard. Well, I think I'll do this. You know, it's easy to go on a diet Sunday night after you've had dinner. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to go on a workout plan until you're so stinking sore you can't even hardly get off the toilet after you get on it. I know about all that. I mean, when I first started working out, I thought I would die. I mean, honestly, I was sore for two years. <laughs> well, I didn't start until I was 63. You think the devil didn't tell me it's too late? Come on, I just had my 70th birthday. I work out three times a week with weights. Man, I should just, look at that muscle. Look at, look at that. have no floppies flying in the winds. And I just get a kick out of showing the enemy that I don't have to be all falling apart, that I can still be strong and do a strong work for God even in the latter years of my life. And I believe the latter glory is going to be greater than the former. Amen. Well, today you might be facing some kind of giant opposition in your effort to accomplishing what you really believe that you're supposed to be doing in life. But remember today that no weapon formed against you will prosper, stand your ground, speak the word over your life in the midst of your assignment from God. Insurgency have gone around Iraq, persecuting Christians, forcing them to leave their villages, their homes, their businesses. Many of those families have seen their children abducted, their husbands being killed right there in front of them. The Iraqi Christians are persecuted intentionally in Iraq. So all the families are leaving. The majority has come to Lebanon because they feel safe, because there's a big Christian community. When we looked around, uh, and uh, saw the need, 
uh, of the Iraqis, we felt the Lord is leading us to the target this group of people with the love and compassion we can provide. Hand of Hope was the first ministry to come alongside with us. Hand of Hope said, well, we want to be the hand of Jesus to the broken world of Lebanon. In a children's program, when kids come and learn about Jesus and go back home and they sing what they have learned, the worship songs, the families, they start asking questions. Why are kids so happy and joyful again? Why do they have their smiles back again? Because in Iraq, the kids stayed home 24-7. They're not allowed to leave home, to play, to have fun, because they're scared of car bombing, of kidnapping uh, for ransom. So here they're finding their joy again, and it's exciting for us. Joyce Meyer makes this happen. Uh, Joyce Meyer uh, supports the Heart for Lebanon Iraqi project. So all the food we buy, uh, if it was the snacks, the lunch, the trips we do, the camps, the retreats, all of that, and alone we cannot do it because it's a big burden and it's high expense. And uh, they want to help us bless the Iraqi refugees by that. So we feel cared and loved by that as well.